Have you ever heard the statement, be doers of the word and not hearers only? Well, we're going to be digging into that today in James chapter 1, verse 22. And so I encourage you to watch the whole 30-minute podcast or video. Uh, it's going to be a blessing and an encouragement to you. Uh, you know, this truth of being a doer of the word and not hearers only is one of the most powerful truths from God's word that we need to understand as a child of God in order to walk out this Christian life the way that he is designed for us to walk it out. So let's get into it. James chapter 1, beginning with verse 22 today. And we begin this section last video. So you can see this on the top of the screen here, this section, verses 21 through 25 of James chapter 1. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. And we started verse 21 last video, and we're going to pick up with it today. Uh, but I want to I want to get into this, okay? When he said, be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. The Greek word for word in that verse is the Greek word logos. And when we take it in context, he's referring to the word of truth in verse 18, which is the gospel. And also, he's making reference to what he will refer to in verse 25, the perfect law of liberty. And so really those are the same thing, in essence, the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he's accomplished for us at the cross through his death and his resurrection. And so that is what James is referring to here when he says, be doers of the word. You know, so often this verse right here, uh, the word for word is normally interpreted as just simply referring to the Bible. Just, In other words, just be a doer of the Bible and not hearers only. You know, that is correct in a sense, but in the really the context of this verse, again, he's referring more to the word of truth, the gospel. So James is not making a blanket statement, just do the word of God on your in your own strength, okay? <laughs> Sometimes people interpret it that way, uh, and, and that James is saying this, just be a doer of the word in your own strength, just figure it out. No, that is not what James is talking about at all. He's talking about something actually much deeper than that, much more specific than that. Now, when he said here, but be, that word for be here is a verb. It's a present middle imperative, which means this, but keep on becoming. So this is important. So James is emphasizing who we are becoming, not just our doing. Does that make sense? Again, he says, but be doers of the word. He's not just emphasizing just doing for the sake of doing. No, not at all. The Holy Spirit is leading him to write it in this way. So he's dealing with, again, who we are, not just what we do. Now, we're going to pick apart every word in this verse here because it's that important. The word doers, as you can see in the screen, is the Greek word poieo, and it means to make something, to express what is in one's heart. And normally it referred to a poet writing a poem or a painter painting a picture. Now in the context here, as you can see on the screen, being a doer of the word means to faithfully express in one's life what the implanted word of truth, the gospel, has done in one's heart. It's really the same principle that Paul gave in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 when he said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. It's not the same Greek word for work out, but it's the same idea, the same truth. Work it out. There's, in other words, there's a work that God has done in you. Okay, There's a word, there's a truth, there's a gospel implant that you have as a child of God, okay? Now express that in your life. Express that in your attitude, in your actions, in our reactions, in our words, okay? What we see, what we look at, what we uh, listen to again. All of that is an expression of the work that God has done in us. Kenneth Weiss, the Greek scholar, this is what he said about this verse. He said, he translated it this way, moreover, keep on becoming doers of the word and stop being hearers only, reasoning yourselves into a false premise and thus deceiving yourselves. And so Kenneth Weiss, again, he shows that the emphasis that James 
is putting here is not just simply on the outward action. Yes, it's a part of it, but it's being. And through our being, we do. And then he mentioned this statement, and not hearers only. And this is important too, because what James is saying here is he's not against hearing the word, not at all. Actually, what he was doing, he was writing it and they would hear it or read it. What he's coming against is simply being a hearer only. And that is what he is emphasizing. Now, when he used that term, hearer only, that was a term used in James' time to describe audit students. An audit student is one who hears the lectures but views the exams as simply optional. Uh, many Christians are audit Christians. In other words, they are hearers only. It's interesting to me that James is dealing with this because this, what he dealt with here, is not simply a first century problem. It's not a Jewish Christian problem. No, it is a human problem. Uh, spanning every generation, including right now. And it's letting us know that us, in our flesh, okay, we can take it personally, in our flesh, we lean towards being hearers only. In other words, just like that audit student, I was a, a teacher in Bible college for 22 years, and I had that great privilege of doing that. And at, and at times, we had audit students. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I want to make that clear, okay? Uh, whatever you do, if you go to a college or whatever, there's nothing wrong inherently being an audit student. But being an audit student of God's Word is wrong. You see, in a class, a, a person can be an audit student. And what that means is they have the privilege of sitting in all of the classes but there's no obligation, there's no requirements upon them to do any requirement, any test, any homework assignment, any anything, any research paper, nothing. They're not obligated to do anything. They are literally hearers only. Now, this is the term that James was using here. And he's saying here, as believers, don't be audit Christians. Don't be hearers only, but be hear, hear the word definitely. But when you hear the word over and over again, again, the word of truth, express that in your life. Again, it's the same truth that Paul was bringing out in Philippians 2 and verse 12. And then he makes this statement at the end of verse 22, deceiving your own selves. What does that mean? Well, you can see on the screen here, it literally means to miscalculate an incorrect reckoning or incorrect calculation, and that, that is about ourselves. You see, it refers to self-deception, a wrong conclusion about one's condition before God, and really a wrong conclusion about God as well. You see, it's a wrong conclusion that what God is wanting from us is simply to hear the word only. That would have been what some believers were believing. They were actually believing that, that, that God just simply wants them to hear the word only, and doing the word is not really that important. Where James is saying here that if we're only hearers only, uh, in one ear and out the other, or we're hearing the word and it's in our head intellectually, but we're not having a heart of faith and hunger and thirst after righteousness. We're not, uh, uh, Jesus is not taking a priority in our life. That, that is what happens when one is simply a hearer only. And he said here, if that's what we are, then we are deceiving ourselves. We are coming to the wrong conclusion about God and about ourselves and about the Word of God. Again, a wrong conclusion, self-deception. I'm not trying to be pessimistic or the cup is half empty, okay? Not at all. But as James wrote here, it implies that there were believers in his day that he was writing to that were self-deceived. You know, Satan is a deceiver. Demonic spirits deceive people. Uh, but you know what the greatest deceiver is? It's our own self. And that's what he referred to, deceiving your own self. Self-deception is the worst deception there is because you believe that the light that is in you is light 
when in reality it's darkness. And I'm not meaning that you're not saved or anything, but when we deceive ourselves as Christians, really it, it's a light that's in us that we think is light, but in reality it's error. It's darkness. And so that is the point that James is making. Be a doer of the word of truth, the gospel. Express it, again, in your actions, your words. Let our whole life be an expression of the truth of the gospel. Moving on to verse 23 here, as you can see in the screen. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, and that's implied a hearer of the word only, he says, he is like unto a man beholding his face or natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholds himself and goes away and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, that's God's work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now let's pick this apart. That word at the end of verse 23, uh, be, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. Again, this is a hearer only and not a doer. That word for glass literally means a mirror, and it's a reference to the perfect law of liberty in verse 25. And I'll add this to it. It's also a reference to the word of truth. Again, the gospel, the message of the cross, the, the glorious gospel, whatever term you want to use for it, the gospel again. That's what James is referring to that he looks into the gospel. And when he looks into the gospel, he beholds his natural face. This is so important. That word natural face here, it refers to the weaknesses of our own self, our flesh. You see, whenever we look into the gospel, that is the way that we correctly see ourselves, the way God sees us. That in our natural self, in our self, we are sinners in need of a Savior. And even as a child of God, okay now, as a new creation in Christ, get, praise God, we're not the old man, old person we used to be, all right? But even in our redeemed state, we, can, we still are weak in ourself. We still have a flesh in which we're weak in. So by continuing to look at the gospel, that's how we see ourselves correctly. That's how we see God correctly. Because we don't see just our weakness, we see his provision. We actually see both, okay? When we look at Christ, we see our weakness and we see his provision in the cross. And that is the greatest blessing there could be. Now, in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, Paul, right along these same lines says something very similar but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the Lord see the word beholding means looking and that's what James is emphasizing look at the gospel and if we're hearers only and not a doer of his work that's in us then we're deceiving ourselves and we're like a person beholding ourselves, our weakness uh, in a mirror, but then we're walking away and forgetting what kind of person we are. So he beholds himself and then goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he is. Now I'm going to dissect this as we go through it. Verse 24, it says, he looks, he goes away and forgets. Pay attention to those words in verse 24. He looks, that's behold, okay? He's looking, looking where? He's looking into the word of truth, the word of God. So he looks, but then what happens? He goes away. And again, looks here is a synonym for the word faith, okay? So he believes, but then goes away in his faith, and then he forgets. What, man, what kind of person that he is, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. He forgets what kind of individual he is. So the sin of the believer is that he goes away from looking at Christ and what he's accomplished the cross. Again, 
this is what James is emphasizing here. So he looks, he goes away and forgets. So that is the sin of this believer, that of, of a hearer only. He's looking and believing, but then he goes away from looking at the cross. And then when we do that, get this, we forget our need for Christ. And that's the result of going away in our faith so often, believers, is that that's what we do. We're looking in the Word, we're looking at the Gospel, we're looking to Jesus, but we're not trusting in Him as we ought to. Now, when I say that, that's not for us to be condemned, like, oh, woe is me, I'll never, I'll, I'll never, you know, be that Christian who can live this Christian life, you know, no, 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 that's, that's not of God, that kind of self-humiliation, no. No, what it is, though, it's a challenge, so I want to say that it's not for us to be condemned, it's, but it is a challenge to our faith. That's what James is doing here. He's not condemning them like, oh, you're losers. You're, you don't have what it takes to live for God. No, 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 not at all. But he is challenging their faith. He's challenging our faith. The Holy Spirit is through his word. So get this, whenever we go away in our faith, in the object of our faith, from Christ and his cross, we will end up going to something else that is spiritual adultery with law or works or worldliness, basically an emphasis upon self. That's where we will go to. Does that make sense? I'm going to say it again. Whenever we go away from looking, staring, observing, focusing on Jesus, who he is, what he's done, and the provision that he's made for us. And remember who Jesus is. He is the word. So whenever we go away from the Bible, we will end up going to our self, selfishness, a self-centered life. But here's the challenge. Keep looking at Jesus. Keep looking at the word of truth. Keep looking. Don't go away. Keep being a here and do what he's done in us. That is the challenge. All right, moving on to verse 25, as you can see in the screen. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Pay attention to those words. But whoso look at, uh, parakupto is the Greek word for looks here. It means to stoop down in order to look. It means to look intently at. Now in that word look at or parakupto, it's the same word used in John 20 and verse 11. And that's, that's a typo. It says John 10. It should be 20. John 20 verse 11, when Mary, it says, but Mary stood outside the tomb, that's of Jesus, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. She paracuptoed into the tomb. Same word here. She looked intently at the tomb. And so we are told, look intently into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein. Continue looking. Continue believing. Continue being a doer of the word and not hearer only. Now, moving on here. Here, the word looks, again, is a figure of speech referring to the object of one's faith. And that's so important here. It's not just the, oh, he looks. No, no. It refers to the object of our faith. Hebrews 12 and verse 2 is the verse that, I mean, nails down the whole biblical principle of object of faith. I think, like, know the verse in the Bible. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author of and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God the Father. I mean, that right there, Paul nails the object of faith, where he uses that word looking. Okay, it's a synonym for faith, but it, it gives an angle of faith that's so important because the, this angle, this perspective, it shows that faith has a focus. Faith has a specific object that we're looking at. It's not ambiguous faith that even the demons have. No, it's specific faith. And that's what we are to have as children of God. Of course, our specific faith includes everything there is in God's Word. 
but it is through, okay, it is through the lens, if I could use that terminology, it's through the lens of Jesus and, and what he's accomplished through his death on the cross and the fact that he's risen from the dead. That is the theme of God's word. And James is emphasizing that we are to keep on looking, keep on believing, keep on being a doer of the word. All right, continuing on in verse 25, as you can see it there on the screen, uh, again, picking this verse apart, but whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty. You know, I have found personally through my study of God's word over the years that this term that James used is one of the most important for us as believers to understand. But what I have found in myself and what I see in others is that so often this term, which is a very specific term that James is using, that the Holy Spirit led him to use, okay, it's not some general statement about God's Word or Old Testament uh, scriptures. You know, so often when this verse is looked at, you know, look into the perfect law of liberty, that term perfect law of liberty often is interpreted as just simply referring to the Word of God, just a very generalized statement about God's Word. And and sometimes it's even interpreted as referring to the Old Testament Word only, not New Testament, but Old Testament Word. And some will even use for example, Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11, as a support, supposedly, to try to view this, interpret this as just simply referring to Old Testament word. Where in that passage, uh, Psalm 19, 7 through 11, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And it goes on with words like that. But I want to emphasize this point. That what James is referring to in this statement is not simply just some generalized statement about God's Word as a whole, okay, Genesis to Revelation, or just simply the Old Testament Scriptures. Absolutely no. This is a, a specific term that Paul's using, and it means the law, that perfect one of the liberty. Now I'm putting here exactly as it's look and it looks in the Greek, okay, the law that perfect one of the liberty. Now I abbreviated the perfect law of liberty into the PLLs. You can see it there on the screen. The perfect law of liberty is this. It's the perfect spiritual law that brings liberty from the power of sin, Satan, and self through Christ and what he accomplished at the cross and his resurrection. Again, this is so important. Again, what is it? It's the perfect spiritual law that brings liberty from the power of sin, Satan, and self through Jesus. And again, what he's accomplished for us. That is what James is referring to. Again, not some ambiguous Old Testament law, as I put here. He's not referring to Old Testament law. Uh, for example, in James 2 and verse 10, he says, For whoever shall keep the whole law, yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. So that right there shows us that James is not pointing the recipients, including us, to old, simply Old Testament law. No, the L Old Testament law does not bring liberty from the power of sin. And so and I think you know that. Now, Galatians 5 and verse 1, Paul writes this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made you free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And I apologize that my box here is on part of the verse here. Uh, but stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has called you, and don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's really the same point that James is making. Another very important word here is the word perfect, and I'm going to take myself off the screen here. The word perfect is the Greek word teleos, and it means brought to a completed end, fully mature, fully accomplished. And so, get this, the PLL, or the, the perfect law of liberty, is the spiritual law that declares that Jesus has fulfilled the Old Testament law. Remember, it's the law, that perfect one of the liberty. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Old Testament law 
brings liberty from the power of sin. That would be completely against what the Bible teaches. But what James is doing here is he's showing us that what Jesus has accomplished for us in, his, in every aspect of his being, but ultimately his death and resurrection, is that Jesus ushered in a new spiritual law. A spiritual law that is greater than the law of sin and death. You know, the perfect law of liberty that the Holy Spirit led James to write about is, in reality, it's the same spiritual law that Paul mentioned in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, when he said, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me, what? Has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so what Paul was describing was a spiritual law that brings us freedom from the power and the penalty and ultimately the very even the very presence of sin. James here same exact thing. It's a spiritual law that brings liberty. And that spiritual law was established by Jesus at the cross. So all who believe, you and I included today, as we believe and continue to believe, it continually brings liberty in our life. Praise the Lord for that. We're going to pick up this verse in the next class, but we're going to stop there today. So God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus. It is our prayer that every video that you can see on this Cornell Ministries YouTube channel is a blessing to you and a help in your walk with the Lord. Let me ask you this. Would you prayerfully consider supporting Cornell Ministries through whether a one-time gift or a reoccurring monthly gift? No matter what the amount is, we would greatly appreciate it. You can do so through our cornellministries.com website. You can see that on the screen. Or you can text to give. Just text that number and just follow the prompts and give that way. Again, whatever the amount is, we would greatly appreciate it. God bless you greatly.